In today's episode, we have a case study, lower back pain in a weightlifter. And this one's me, how I fixed my lower back injury and got back to squats and deadlifts. Let's do it. Welcome to the Fitness Pain Free Show where I help physical therapists learn how to get their clients out of pain and back to training in the gym. My name is Dan Pope, and I'll be your instructor. I'm a physical therapist, coach, and fellow meathead. I love training just as much as you do and want to help you get all of your patients out of pain and back to the gym where they belong. First and foremost, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your support. You allow me to do what I love for a living. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist, coach, personal trainer, and meathead. I love fitness. I love lifting weights. This is the Fitness Pain Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back to training. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button, send me a comment, and subscribe to the channel. It helps the algorithm. If you like the content, please, please do that. It's going to keep me doing it again in the future. And if you're listening to this via podcast, leave me a positive rating and review. It also helps a ton. Thank you. If you want to go the extra step and really support me, consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content from me. It's been updated monthly for the past five plus years. It's an absolute no-brainer for $1. So if you're looking for that next step in terms of improving your education for me, this is where to do it. It's got a private Facebook group, so you can contact me. You can decide upcoming podcast topics. Um, and yeah, you can get started for $1 for a week-long trial. After that, it's just $12.99 per month. You can cancel any time that you want to. You're not going to hurt my feelings, uh, but I really appreciate it if you consider it. So if you want to sign up, head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library to get started. And there'll also be a link in the show notes. So what caused my lower back pain? What was the mechanism of injury? So I'm going to do my best to try to figure out why. This is the same thing that I do with my patients. We want to get an idea of why people got hurt so that we can prevent some injury in the future and make sure we don't perpetuate this injury by doing the same things got you hurt in the first place, right? So I've been having recurrent low back pain since the birth of my son. This is about 1.5 years ago, and I've had about three to four bouts of lower back pain. Uh, and I got to tell you, I have a long history of competing in strongman and CrossFit. Um, I was a pole vaulter in college at Rutgers University. And really, I had very little to no lower back pain. I had a few bouts here and there. Uh, I think if you're competing in strongman, it's impossible not to kind of tweak your back at least a little bit. But generally speaking, my back was very strong and didn't have any trouble. Uh, and since the birth of my son, I've had several bouts of low back pain. So things change a little bit, right? Um, so why is this? Well, I guess, I'm, I'm, again, I'm just guessing here, uh, but generally speaking, my stress levels have gone up and my sleep levels have gone down. As a new father, uh, sometimes babies don't sleep as well as you like them to, and you have to tend to them in the middle of the night, right? On top of that, I recently purchased a new home, which is awesome. We're very excited about that. Uh, but moving into that new home and trying to do all the home renovations is tough. On top of that, I'm still juggling my business and family. I'm a physical therapist. I do a lot of stuff outside of my nine to five, as you guys know. And my wife is also a very busy professional too. She's a family medicine physician. She works a lot. So um, managing all those things is challenging and stress levels go up as a result, right? I put some citations um, on these as well. So if you want to go check out these studies, I'm citing about sleep and stress correlating with injury. Feel free to check those out, right? On top of that, in terms of training, I do a lot of squatting. I do a lot of deadlifting. I like heavy lower body strength training, which uh, in and of itself is going to be a risk factor for low back pain, right? Uh, as much as I love weightlifting and don't think anyone should stop for this reason, uh, low back injuries are number one, generally speaking, for most people that like to do weight training and squats and deadlifts tend to be the thing that create that as well as perpetuate that over the course of time. Uh, and I squat and deadlift every single week, right? So I think that's a risk factor for me. On top of that, my psychology plays into this. Um, you know, I've been reading some really cool research re recently about psychological profi profiles that correlate with injury. And two big ones that correlate with injury are perfectionism, a specific type of perfectionism, as well as athletic identity. 
So if you're a perfectionist in the gym and you feel like you really have to push to make sure you get everything done on a weekly basis, despite maybe how bad you might feel or worn down you feel, you're a little more likely to get hurt. And we'll talk about this in a minute as it correlates to my recent injury. On top of that, athletic identity. So if you identify as a fitness person or someone who really, really values their sport, then you're going to be more likely to push and if you have an injury, if you have pain, you know, to try to uh, continue perpetuating this idea of being a strong, fit individual, right? Your sen sense of self-worth is wrapped up in being fit, strong, all those good things, right? And last piece that I think was really relevant for me was I had a smaller injury, so I had some soreness, and it kind of led to a bigger injury. And we have some research in soccer players that non-time loss injuries, so injuries that don't force you to stop practicing, um, more likely will turn into larger injuries, which tend to be time loss injuries, which is exactly what happened for me. Started off with some soreness, um, wasn't limiting my ability to train and it ended up being a bigger injury and it definitely limited my ability to train. Right. Um, and here's the thing. If you want to see me go uh, in depth on reasons why people get hurt in the gym, I have a mini course on this. It's called the fitness pain free mini course. And one of the modules is seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym and what to do about it. I'll leave a link in the show notes, but definitely check that out if you want to go in depth on this topic. So, you know, going back on my mechanism of injury, what kind of happened in the days prior to getting hurt? Well, um, new home, right? And I have a new driveway that goes with it and it's winter time in New England and it's going to snow, right? And we had a snowstorm which required several hours worth of shoveling, right? And then um, once I was done, Shoveling, it snowed again. And I think it was about three days of snowing. Um, and like I said, it's a new house, new steep driveway. And I was doing a ton of shoveling. At the time, the uh, the snowblower we had, the machine wasn't working. Um, AKA, I didn't know how to use it. Eventually, we figured it out, right? And uh, I was getting pretty sore from all the shoveling um, in my lower back. And I knew this, but I just I wanted to make sure I got to, got my driveway plowed and I, someone's got to do it, right? So. When I was in the gym in the week or two leading up to this injury, I did modify some of my training slightly just because my back was tweaked a little bit. So I was doing more remaining deadlifts over conventional deadlifts. I was going a little less heavy. I was increasing the reps. Um, but that was probably what started everything. So one fateful day, I was quite fatigued and sore. And I've been running two to three times a week for the past several years. I am currently preparing for a 10k and my workouts were getting harder and harder i was doing these tempo runs and i was just sore from the shoveling and life and i was actually peaking for the end of a month right and i knew that i was sore in my lower back i knew that my right hamstring was actually getting very tight uh which you know may have actually been ridiculous symptoms at the time but i didn't think of it right and in my head from a psychological perspective i kind of thought all right, so this is week three. Usually week three, week four is when I really push things from a program perspective. So I'm going to really hit this run hard. Um, and then the, my other thought was that this is a little soon in the month to be peaking and to feel this bad. So what I'll probably end up doing is I'll finish this run and then I'll kind of deload on Friday. So the, the run was, I think, on a Sunday. And my plan was to actually do another tough run that coming Friday. But in my mind, I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Let's see if we can get through this workout. And then on Friday, we'll just deload because your body is so beat up, right? And this kind of goes back to that psychological profile, right? I care greatly about being a good athlete, pushing my strength, pushing my fitness, pushing my ability to run. I think a lot of folks, if they felt as bad as I did, they would just bag it and just take it easier. This is kind of a funny story. I remember texting my coworker, Kevin, and saying, hey, buddy, my hamstring is killing me. I'm scared of this workout. What should I do? And it was more of a joke, right? Kevin's a runner. We run together and we're both planning on doing this 10K together. He's like, you know what? You should probably take it easy. Get on the treadmill. Uh, just do what you can, right? And I was like, nah, I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to finish this workout, right? Um, and it was a joke, but it's funny because um, it's one of those do as I say, not as I do moments, right? Because if someone told me how bad they felt, I would say, hey, you know, be careful. Back off a little bit. I didn't follow that advice. I just, I went full send that day, right? So when I did the run, I was sore and it was very challenging the entire time, right? One of the things that happens to me, especially on a treadmill, is that as a treadmill is going, once I get tired, I'm trying to hang on for, you know, dear life. 
and I will overextend. I'll really lean back quite a bit uh, while I'm running. And I think this is mostly because it's my compensation when I'm tired, I start running that way. Uh, but the other piece is that the treadmill doesn't slow down. So it, it pushes that even a little bit more for me. So I was actually pretty sore while I was running. And that night I was like, oh man, ah, I, I pushed it a little too hard, but I wasn't that painful, right? What happened was over the course of the week, it just got worse and worse, right? And to be honest, when I got this on Sunday, uh, my pain was pretty bad, but it, it definitely got worse. Worse, I think the worst day was Friday. I was really, really sore. So this is one of those ones that built up over the course of the week, right? So let's try to diagnose my lower back pain. We'll do it as a uh, traditional physical therapist, okay? So we're going to do a kind of a soap note for my lower back pain, okay? Subjectively, what was I feeling? My aggravating factors were initially sitting was really painful uh, that Friday. So I hurt myself on Sunday. That Friday, I had to do a lot of sitting and recording. And it's actually funny because I was recording a lecture on lower back pain while I had low back pain. Uh, and sitting was actually pretty painful. I didn't realize it, but sitting for a while um, definitely set me back. And I sat for a few hours to record. My back was pretty sore. I didn't realize this, but when I got up, it hurt a lot worse. So I set, my set myself back that Friday just by recording a bunch of podcasts um, and videos on low back pain, right? Hinging or bending was completely out of the question. So I couldn't bend forward whatsoever. So if someone asked me to do like, let's say a body weight good morning, I would get maybe five degrees of flexion at my hip before I had to stop immediately because it was so painful, right? Uh, and any, any sort of lifting was kind of out of the equation, right? I can't bend forward. So picking something up is not going to happen. It's a bit of an issue because I have a son right? Who likes to be lifted. What kind of symptoms was I experiencing? Well, most of my pain was, was local. It was right in my spine, uh, right around, let's say L4, L5. Maybe it went into my hips slightly, but really most of that pain was local, right? Right in that area. I did have a little bit of numbness and tingling in the top of my left foot. Uh, I've had that for years off and on. It was a little bit worse uh, after I had this recent low back injury. So it did exacerbate things. Uh, and here's the big takeaway here. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I wasn't very concerned with my low back pain, right? And this is important to let your patients know this. I had no medical red flags, right? So basically, I wasn't dealing with anything that requires some sort of emergent medical care or surgical in, uh, intervention, right? So that would be some sort of cancer or infection, some sort of spinal fracture or called equina syndrome or severe neurologic compromise, right? So Generally speaking, low back pain feels terrible and feels like it's a terrible problem that needs to be addressed with something more um, intense or less conservative, right? Like injections, medications, something, right? However, uh, it's not for the large majority of people unless you have one of these red flags. And I didn't, no red flags. So, you know, as bad as it felt, uh, I could treat this conservatively, right? How about objective measurements? You know, if you took me through a physical therapy evaluation, what would you find? Well, first and foremost, I had no dermatomal or myotomal issues. So I had no weakness, right? I can walk on my toes. I can walk on my heels. I have no weakness in knee extension, hip flexion, abduction, uh, doing pretty good there. Uh, no issues with sensation left to right. Everything felt normal. Uh, my reflexes were good. So I wasn't dealing with a severe neurologic compromise or anything like that. I had some tender to palpation on my L3 to L5 vertebrae. I think the injury is somewhere in that area, if I had to guess. And this worsen, worsened with PA pressure. So I had my colleague, uh, co-worker Kevin, do some PA glides on my vertebrae. And yep, it hurts, L3 to L5, right? As I said before, I was completely limited in my ability to touch my toes. I was limited in my hinge <laughs> about 100%. And uh, that resolved in the first two weeks or so. So initially, flexion did not feel great, especially uh, with gravity uh, resisting me a little bit. So trying to stand up and touch my toes. Um, initially, flexion didn't feel too bad if I just, let's say, did a cat-cow. I actually felt pretty good. Uh, extension, however, was much worse, right? <clears throat> and it's funny because initially, I was limited in extension about 50%. Whereas, you know, with the toe touch, it was about 100% limited. But over the course of time, flexion resolved quickly, but extension did not. Uh, extension was more lingering pain in the following weeks. Historically, 
I have more extension based low back pain. Uh, being a strongman competitor, trying to press a lot of stuff overhead that probably shouldn't be pressed overhead and requires a lot of spinal extension in order to do that. And that's kind of how I init initially irritate my spine. I also injured my spine most recently running in too much extension. So I think extension was probably what gave me the trouble, right? That caused this and this, this uh, big flare up of pain. And I would classify myself more as extension based low back pain in the following few weeks. What else did we find in our objective measurements? Well, initially I had a crossed straight leg raise. Um, if you don't know about a crossed straight leg raise, you lay on your back, both legs are straight. You lift one leg as high as you can. It's kind of like a hamstring flexibility test. It's also a nerve tension test. And I had the opposite side leg as my ridiculous symptoms, my numbness and tingling was limited, about 30%. And this could just be my hamstring being really uh, stiff and sore, like I thought it was from all the running. And it could also be radicular issues. It could be a sign that I was dealing with some sort of disc pathology, right? The other thing is that extension hurt, extension plus rotation hurt, right? So whenever you're extending the spine, you're compressing the elements on the posterior side of the spine. So the facet joints, that could also be a pars fracture. And to be honest, I actually have a step-off deformity which I didn't realize. So if you're not familiar with the step off deformity, it's when you have a pars fracture in your spine, right? You have a spondylolysis and then you have some slippage of one vertebrae on the other, which is spondylolisthesis. And you can feel the difference in height of the spinous processes as you palpate in the lumbar spine, right? So I potentially had some sort of disc pathology uh, or an old or re-aggravated spondy injury, right? Maybe I fractured at one point in my life and it's just flared up. I have no idea, right? We don't have any MRI. Uh, we didn't take an x-ray to see if there's any difference there. I'm just guessing. Who knows? The big thing is I don't have any medical red flags. I'm actually getting on pretty good uh, right now. So what is the assessment? What is Dan dealing with here? So it, it's funny because I start all of my assessments like this in my notes. So Patient presents with signs and symptoms consistent with disc pathology and or spondylolysis slash spondylolisthesis from being an idiot in the gym, right? So I think I'm dealing with some disc injury. I think I might have some spondy base injuries. I don't really know. It probably occurred from a variety of factors, which we already discussed, right? So that's the assessment of why I got hurt. So now what do we do to get out of pain? What's our plan of care to help this patient, aka me? right? So like I said before, there's no medical red flags and that's a great sign. So basically I'm just going to keep sending it in the gym. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but only kind of, right? Because if you don't have any medical red flags, it's a really good sign that you want to keep moving. We know that with lower back pain, it's super important that you keep moving after an injury, keep going to work, keep doing your regular activities as much as you can try to stay active uh, while respecting the healing area. In low back pain, we think this is a self-limiting condition, which basically means your body gives you pain. You don't do anything stupid, generally speaking, because it hurts so bad. But over the course of time, it just heals itself, right? Especially for disc pathology. And again, if you want to check out any of these um, studies, go ahead and check out the show notes. I have the links there, okay? So yeah, it's probably going to resolve over the course of time. And then what I need to do is modify my training and lifestyle activities to respect the healing injury. What's kind of cool is that pain actually does that for me, right? It's kind of a built-in alarm system that's going to kind of calibrate how much I do, govern how much I do over the course of time, and allow me to progress, right? <laughs> it's kind of cool. Pain is a good thing, right? It's kind of hard to tell that to your patients, right, and tell them it's a good thing that they hurt so badly. Uh, but generally speaking, pain can be helpful, right? And then I want to slowly ramp back into my training and my exercise routine, right? We know that an active approach helps to reduce low back pain. And what's kind of cool is it doesn't really seem to matter too much what kind of active approach you take. So Pilates helps, yoga helps, walking helps, strength training helps. All that stuff is really beneficial for low backs, right? And if I apply a strength training program, I know this is going to help to reduce my recurrence rate. So obviously I've been struggling with low back injuries lately. I said three to four since the birth of my son, which is a lot. Uh, so I want to make sure I reduce my recurrence rates. On top of this, I love strength training. So if I can continue strength training, right, keep working towards my goals. And on top of that, that's going to help me 
A, get out of pain, but B, reduce the likelihood to have pain in the future, that's a huge win-win, all right? So if you're the type of physical therapist that works with an active population that loves working out, keep them working out, all right? Don't stop them. You just have to be smart about how we do it. And I'm going to show you how I did it with me. So the next piece is that you want to stay positive, okay? I'm a physical therapist. I deal with low back pain every day of the week. I have so many people that come with low back pain. I know that if you don't have medical red flags, this is something that's probably going to get better over the course of time. We don't have to worry very much. This is going to get better, okay? However, when you're dealing with low back pain, this can feel like the most emergent situation in the world, right? You can't do anything that you want to do. You can't sit. You can't stand. You can't move. You can't concentrate, okay? One of the things that I experienced over the past several weeks is that it was extremely hard for me to do any sort of work. I couldn't focus. My back was taking the focal point of everything I was doing on a regular basis. And this plays huge psychological mind games with people, right? And for folks that have a high athletic identity, they don't feel that they can do anything that they love to do. They can't do fitness. They can't do strength training. They can't deadlift. They can't squat. And that's all wrapped up in their sense of self-worth, right? So if you're like me and you really care about your ability to deadlift a lot of weight, you feel that you lost a major piece of what makes you you when you have this big injury and it sucks. So I think it's really, really important that you have empathy for your patients, okay? Because we know that this is going to get better over the course of time, but they don't feel that way, okay? So we have to do two things. We have to instill hope in them that they're going to get better. You have to let them know that statistically, yeah, you're going to get better. For most people, it's going to get better. And it may feel absolutely terrible, but we know that this is a part of the back pain. It gets better over the course of time. But on top of that, you still have to have a lot of empathy, right? You can't just belittle all their pain. They're going to get really pissed off at you. So you have to strike this balance of instilling hope, being positive, all right, but not belittling their pain, okay? So, and then the last piece for me, and I do this for all my patients, that we have to figure out, let's say, why someone got hurt in the first place. And we want to try to avoid any prior mistakes, right? I love this saying that the body keeps a score, right? So basically, pain and injury is your body's way of trying to protect you. And over the course of time, your body is more apt to give you pain, right, in the future if you do things that are similar to how you got hurt in the past, all right? And that's just your body's way of protecting you. It's an awesome thing that the body has. It's a good thing. Uh, but, but unfortunately, that also means you're more likely to experience more pain in the future. So I just have to be smart about my training, be a bit of a detective, try to figure out how I got hurt in the first place, and try not to repeat those past mistakes. All right. So how do you fix lower back pain during squats and deadlifts? So I already did a very in-depth show on this. I'm going to put the link in the show notes and I'll put a link here. You can click if you're directly uh, or directly on the screen. If you're watching this via YouTube, I have four steps to success. All right. Number one is to modify and or temporarily limit aggravating training and lifestyle activities to allow the irritated lower back to calm down. Number two, identifying correct mobility limitations in the ankle, hip, shoulders, and thoracic spine to reduce stress on the spine if you have any sort of limitations. Number three, correct technique issues in the squat, deadlift, and Olympic lifts. And for me, it's also going to be for running, okay, and not as much for the squat, deadlift, and Olympic lifts because my technique is pretty good, and I'm actually not doing much in terms of Olympic lifting right now. So I'm sorry if this video is a bit of a bait and switch. And I said that I was doing rehab and a weightlifter. I like lifting weights in the gym. I'm currently not doing Olympic lifts. Okay. And number four, start gradually loading the spine through a progressive strengthening programs, uh, excuse me, program, which is basically just going to be progressive overload for the spine. And lastly, you just want to have a slow transition back to your prior program. And let me show you exactly how I did this. So. First step, modify aggravating lifestyle activities. So what hurt me, especially initially? Prolonged sitting was a big one. I didn't actually realize this until I tried to sit for a long time. So I hurt myself on Sunday, and then I just kind of got on with my life. And, you know, I'm lucky just because my daily um, job and career and activities don't require me to do a lot of sitting for a long period of time. Uh, besides sitting down and recording these podcasts, which is kind of funny. Um, so I didn't even realize that my low back didn't tolerate sitting for long periods until about five days after I injured it. 
And then I was, I was dying after trying this. Okay. And I knew, okay, well, I got it. I shouldn't be sitting for a long period of time. Right. Like my, my body told me, my brain told me like, Hey, stop doing that. Like, okay. You know, message received. So I started sitting with a posture that was slightly extended. Okay. And that felt a lot better. Um, so with your patients, you can tell them to have, let's say a towel roll under their lower back. You can have them just extend a bit more when they're sitting, sitting in a higher seat over low seat usually helps a bit with this. The other piece is that any form of hinging really, really bothered me, uh, which honestly was kind of hilarious. If you're watching me trying to treat my patients, because basically I needed to stay stark upright for everything, right? So basically if I was trying to lean forward over my patient, do any sort of manual therapy, I could not. <laughs> So I just looked like I was 103 years old uh, every single day. And that's okay. You know, it's, it's part of it. So it's, you know, everyone gets low back pain. They're going to go through this and, you know, it, it's funny to me, you know, hopefully other people around me thought it was at least a little bit funny too. All right. So initially I, I stopped doing that. Okay. The other thing that killed me was uh, lifting and carrying my son. And for a little bit, I just didn't pick him up and, you know, he cried a little extra and, you know, I apologize for that, Luke. I'm sorry. Uh, if he wanted to be held, I'd say, hey, Luke, come over here to the couch. We would sit down together and I would I would just hold him from there so I didn't have to pick him up. Right. So luckily that resolved over the course of about two weeks and I was able to pick my son up again. And uh, at work, I have to do a lot of lifting. I lift dumbbells, barbells, plates because we're working out with my patients all the time. Right. Um, and what I did was I, I, I just basically modified things as best as I could with my biomechanics. Right. And I had the students help me out. I said, hey, I got a patient coming and they got a deadlift. Do you mind helping me with the weights? And they said, yeah, no problem. And that helped a lot. And like I said, you know, these first two weeks, I limped around like a weirdo. Uh, it was slightly hilarious. If I dropped something on the floor, I did that stark upright torso. If you ever had low back pain, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, where you can't bend forward. So you do this like weird split squat thing where you try to get down to the floor without bending over at all. And you grab your pencil that you dropped and then you come upright really quick and you know, it just looks funny. Um, but yeah, I, you know, that was my way of respecting my spine in the first two weeks or so. Uh, so that over the course of time, it can make some progress, right? Just talked a lot about what hurts. Uh, we also want to talk about what helps because early on in the rehab process, doing more of what feels good and staying away from stuff that aggravates can really help people out a lot from a pain perspective and from a psychological perspective. Uh, I knew that my spine liked frequent position changes, right? So the first four days after my injury, I didn't have to sit for a long period of time. And you know what? My spine really liked that. And then when I had to sit for a while, my back hated that. Okay. So I knew that I need to do more position changes throughout the course of the day. I also knew my spine really liked low level exercises. So I always felt quite a bit better after doing some walking, some cat camels, bird dogs, glute bridges, side bridges, plank variations. So I actually did that several times per day. I'd wake up, do some of these exercises. Sometimes during lunch, I do a few of these exercises. And then in the evening, I do it as well, just because it made me feel so much better. And it's probably helping me get better more quickly. Here's the other piece. Time. <laughs> time helps folks with injuries. Most folks are going to get better over the course of time, regardless of what they do. Okay. Time is that element that helps. Uh, and really two to three weeks into this injury, I didn't have to modify anything in my lifestyle anymore. Right. I could pick up my son. I could bend forward. I could do, you know, I could take that the trash. You know, I could do all the basic things I do regularly in my daily life. And I was feeling pretty good. So you also have to modify your training to respect and rehabilitate the injury. Right. And for me, running was what hurt me. And then when I tried to run after my injury, I couldn't do it anymore. It hurt too bad. Okay. But here's the thing. I want to keep my training as similar as possible as what it was written as. So I can keep making fitness goals over the course of time. And I don't want to get deconditioned at any given time too. So I want to, I want to try to keep my conditioning up and my running train up as much as I can while respecting the injury. Right. So normally I run twice per week. I have one day that has some steady state with a tempo run in the middle, followed by some steady state. And then I also have an interval run, which is the same thing. So some long, slow, followed by an interval, followed by some long, slow, right? And the first week when I tried to run, just didn't happen whatsoever. I remember the first time I tried, I live in a neighborhood that has a lot of hills and I started walking. I'm like, oh boy, my back is really sore, right? And I remember trying to go up and down some hills. My back was like, nah, dude, <laughs> I don't like this. And I tried jogging for a little bit, you know, and it was actually quite painful, maybe like a five, six, seven out of 10. 
Um, and I was kind of thinking, well, maybe it'll warm up. And you know what? It just didn't. Um, so yeah, I had to respect my lower back, my low back kind of won that day from a running perspective. So I just walked, right? I tried to walk quickly when I, when I was able to, I also found that I had to really walk on a, you know, a, a level surface. My back was just not tolerating uh, any sort of hills. And I had to kind of walk slowly initially, right? But over the course of time, I got better and better. And I found by week three, I was actually able to run and I couldn't run fast. My back didn't like that. So week three, I did two long, slow runs, which was great. By week four, I was able to get back to the swing of my normal training. So I was able to do a tempo run as well as an interval, interval run. Uh, so for the tempo runs, all I did was I, I knocked a minute off my minute mile pace. Uh, so I went a little bit slower than usual. My back was fine with that. And on my interval day, I did the same thing. I went a little bit slower than normal on my interval. And I also increased the interval duration. So it went from about a three on three off to a five on five off simply because for five minutes of running, you can't run as fast as just three minutes of running. So I slowed it down a little bit. And week five, I was more or less back to my normal training. I could actually follow my, my running programming, uh, although I was out of shape. <laughs> so naturally things were a little slower uh, just because I ended up having to take so much time off from running. Uh, but the other piece is I tried to maintain my fitness as much as possible. So I think if I stopped running completely, I would have been in a worse place, right? Uh, both from a rehab perspective, because your body adapts to the stress that you throw at it. So I think trying to run this entire time actually helped me heal and rehabilitate and also keep my fitness a little bit higher, uh, which is going to help me in terms of long term getting um, more fit for my 10K. But the other part is that if you have an injury, basically your body is used to dealing with a certain amount of volume of training and then when you get hurt you have much less volume of training. And then when you start feeling better, if you go right back to your activities prior, you just spiked your training volumes. So I think when you're trying to rehabilitate from an injury, if you can continue exercising as much as possible, you're less likely to spike your volume when you return, right? Makes sense. So the other thing I had to modify quite heavily was my weightlifting, right? And normally I will strength train two to three times per week. I do mostly total body sessions. I'm much busier than I used to be. I can't spend as much time in the gym as I'd like to, uh, maybe at some point in the future. Uh, for right now, I am working nine to five. I am also running an online business. I do traveling, speaking, and I'm trying to publish you know, courses, books, all sorts of stuff at all times. I'm very, very busy. I have a family, all that stuff. So basically, I work out two to three times a week, total body sessions. I actually follow the programs I sell at fitness pain free if you want to check out my training program currently it's ain't nobody got time for that which i'll put a link in the show notes if you want to follow along with how i train right i have that for you so generally speaking i want to keep all of my training as similar as possible while respecting the healing injured area my low back right uh, what that means is that i'm going to have to pretty aggressively modify certain movements and other movements i don't have to modify very much at all right so when it comes to the upper body, my upper body strength training, um, I don't have to modify very much just because, you know, bench press doesn't really bug me too much as long as I bring my legs up on the bench, right? So I turned some of my dumbbell work into barbell work. And the reason for this is that taking heavy dumbbells out of the rack was a no-go, right? However, if I just put a bunch of small plates on a barbell and I just took it out of the rack and let's say bench press, that wasn't bad at all, right? When it came to single arm rows, that did not feel great on the spine. So I just substituted a chest support row instead. Problem solved. My bend over rows, not happening, right? I couldn't bend over initially. Turned those into pull-ups and or pull-downs, which were tolerated quite well. And then for the bench press, I just put my feet up on the bench, right? So extension-based low back pain. When you're bench pressing, especially if you have an aggressive arch, it doesn't feel great on a spine that doesn't handle extension very well. So I just picked my legs up, right? And any incline work, I had to make it a little bit more flat just because that compression on my spine didn't feel phenomenal, right? But really, I didn't have to modify much, week or two, and then I was back to all my normal weightlifting for my upper body. Now, the deadlift <laughs> is just another story, okay? The deadlift was something I had to heavy, heavily modify, right? And I want to show you my program leading up to this injury. So basically, the deadlift variation I was doing this month was a barbell Romanian deadlift. I was already modifying a little bit because my back was a little bit tweaked, uh, but that wasn't limiting my ability to lift in the gym. 
So weeks one and two, the goal was to do four sets of 12 of barbell Romanian deadlift. I was able to get through this. This was before I really injured my back. And then at the start of week three, boom, injury occurred. Running, back hurt a lot. And then I can't even bend forward, right? Um, you know, I'm trying to continue training as normally as possible while respecting this injury site. What can I do that's similar to a deadlift? Not much, right? One of my favorite exercises for people that are really irritated that can't deadlift is going to be a hip thrust, okay? I couldn't tolerate any hindering whatsoever, but I could do some glute bridge stuff. So what I ended up doing was a sandbag hip thrust, and I used a 30-pounder, and I just did high reps with it, nice and slow, pause the top, get a little work for the low back, get a little work for the glutes and hamstrings without aggravating things, right? Over the next few weeks, I was able to tolerate a little bit more. So week four, I was doing a kettlebell TRX hip thrust, which I can load a little bit heavier. And I was actually able to go down in repetitions. So the load goes up, repetitions go down. Generally speaking, injured low backs, myself especially, can't tolerate a lot of loading. So you start with higher reps and go down to lower reps just because naturally as the reps go down, the weights go up, right? Week five, I was actually able to tolerate barbell hip thrusting, right? So the loads are going up more and more. I was pausing at the top still because I couldn't use a ton of weight. So I do 135 pounds, 165, 175, 175 for 10. So you can see those weights are going up a lot more than the sandbag hip thrust at the very beginning, right? And that following week, I was able to tolerate some high handle trap bar deadlifting, although I used a tempo. So two seconds on the way down, two seconds on the way back up again. And the weights are actually still pretty light for me anyway. So I started at 135. I worked my way up to about 195. I made the decision at 195. That's about all my back is going to handle for that day. And then the following week, I was able to handle some low handle trap bar deadlifts for sets of 10s and 12s at around a 7 or 8 out of 10 RPE, right? So another great way to reduce the load um, and still get a training effect is just to do a lower RPE. So RPE, if you've never heard of it, is a rating of perceived exertion. I use this all the time to prescribe intensities uh, for my patients. So a 10 out of 10 is the most challenging set you could ever do. Zero out of 10 is like nothing. Most people are constantly training somewhere between eight or um, eight to a 10 out of 10, I'd say, depending on the person and their uh, personality, right? Uh, so I just took a few not notches off of that. I started at 205 and worked up at 245. My back was not hurting. I would probably be working in the 300 to 400 range. So just give you an idea of what I was tolerating at that point, right? And after about week eight or so, and I'm actually at the week eight mark, so who knows what I'm going to be doing next. Um, uh, my back pain will determine what I'll be doing. Uh, but I think my next planned exercise is a snatch grip deficit deadlift. I'm going to go into the gym next week and I'm going to give it a, give it a go and see how it, how it goes. And if I'm feeling great, I'm just going to do the prescribed sets and reps for the day. If I'm not, maybe I'll elevate it a little bit to just a regular snatch grip deadlift. Uh, maybe I'll do an RPE, maybe I'll do a tempo, depending. So, so far, I'm actually feeling pretty good. I can hinge again without too much pain, and uh, I'm progressing back. So, it's it's pretty cool, right? How about the other lifts in the gym? How did I have to modify the squat when I initially had that injury? So, if you take a look, and I apologize if you're listening to this via podcast, I actually have my workouts for eight weeks all written out. So if you want to check out and see exactly what I did, see the exercises, see the plan, see how I modify things, definitely check out the YouTube video for this. Two weeks prior to the injury, I was doing uh, transformer bar squats. And if you don't know what a transformer bar is, it's an awesome piece of equipment uh, made by Chris Duffin. So it's basically an, an adjustable safety squat bar, which is pretty cool because you can uh, theoretically uh, have the same torso angle and hip position. Um, as let's say a goblet squat, but you can load it up a lot heavier, right? And it looks like a safety squat bar, which is really cool because my back tends not to tolerate too much kind of low bar back squatting more recently anyway. And the safety squat bar allows me to be a little more upright, which makes my back and my hips feel quite a bit better. So first week, uh, two weeks, I was supposed to be doing four sets of 10 and things were going really well. Even though my back was sore, it wasn't limiting my ability to get better each week. The injury happened week three, right? So you can see right here, got injured. And squatting did not feel phenomenal. But after a long warm-up, I was able to tolerate some body weight squatting 
if I really elevated my heels a lot. Okay. Couldn't really tolerate much else. So one of the things you can do, which I did that day to try to get a training effect when your injury is not tolerating loading is you do blood flow restriction training. And this is cool because in some of the research we have about blood flow restriction training, it actually gives you similar improvements in strength and hypertrophy as regular loading. And this has even been studied in a powerlifting population, which is awesome because I love powerlifting and my training is kind of similar to them. So in my mind, I knew, well, I can't squat heavy. That stinks. You know, I don't want to lose progress. What can I do to continue working towards my goals while respecting this area? Can't tolerate any loading. What can I do? I can do BFR. And that's exactly what I did. Elevated the heels, make your torso more upright. Usually that's a little more friendly for the spine. I had to use a bit of a tempo. I couldn't go that fast, but I was doing sets of 30, 15, 15, 15. And I lived the fight for another day. And I'm still increasing the strength of my lower body. Awesome, right? As I got better, I still did BFR for another week, except now I could add a little bit of load. So I was holding the sandbag out in front of me while I squatted and kept the sets and reps the same. Week five, I was able to tolerate a little bit of loading. I was doing a paused goblet squat. So the pause is going to decrease the weight that I can use, which actually worked out pretty well because I couldn't handle a whole lot of weight. As you can see, I was doing sets of um, 12 repetitions. And I started with 12 kilograms, worked my way up to 18 kilograms. On that day, I just, I knew that my back wasn't going to tolerate more. The following week, I was able to get rid of the heels elevation and just do regular goblet squats, a little bit controlled. So still a little bit of tempo, right? But not as slow as the prior week. And I worked a little higher. So I was able to work up to 24 kilograms doing goblet squats, right? Week seven and eight, I was back to doing safety spot squat bar squats, right? So this, this came back, my squat came back a little faster than my deadlift, which is pretty common when it comes to low back pain. So I was doing safety bar squats again with 135 to 155 for sets of 10 to 12. Uh, week one, prior to hurting myself, I was doing 160 to 180. So I'm still not quite back to where I was before. And this is due to some deconditioning, but also due to um, my back still hurting me a little bit. So over the next few weeks, I'm sure I'm just going to increase the speeds, increase the loads, and hopefully be back to my regular training in another week or two, right? So what other exercises in the gym did I have to modify uh, to respect the lower back injury? Well, a couple that were interesting to me, uh, first was a leg press. So right after I got injured, you know, I was supposed to leg press maybe five days after I got the injury. And I, I thought that this was going to feel terrible right? One of the things I tell my patients all the time is don't expect movements in the gym to feel bad. Try them, warm up, go slowly, of course, but if it feels good, go for it, right? So I, I kind of thought the leg press was going to go poorly for me, right? I, at the time, I couldn't even pick up weights or plates to like put them on the leg press machine, right? And then like getting down on the floor was like a catastrophe, right? If you watch me move, you're like, this dude is 36 years old, but looks like he's 112 years old, right? Because I was in so much pain. Well, what's funny is that, you know, I'd, I'd hobble into the leg press, right? You know, do this really weird hand on one knee, grab the plate, you know, slide my knees forward, try to keep my torso upright to pick up a plate to put on the leg press, right? Looking like I'm 130 years old and I'd get into the leg press to, to actually do the movement. And lo and behold, it felt pretty good. Um, and that's always funny. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I loaded things up. I would recommend maybe using smaller plates to load up the leg press. If this is you right. Lifting up 45 doesn't feel phenomenal. Um, but it was kind of cool because I was able to hit a new rep max for that week. So I didn't have to go down and wait whatsoever or modify the leg press. And, um, I think this is really important, uh, point. So when folks with low back pain, especially folks that have a high athletic identity, uh, their sense of self-worth is really wrapped up in being strong and fit. Um, if you can find exercises to help to train their lower body and train their spine a little bit and allow them to keep making progress in the gym, this is an enormous win, right? Because you can show someone that, hey, you can still train. We can still get under some heavy loads and get some work in, right? And so some folks, I if I, so for me, I didn't feel the need to leg press three times per week, but you can make the argument that for someone that, tolerates leg press, but nothing else, just leg press, just leg press three days per week. Cause you're still going to get a lot of great lower body strength training in 
and it doesn't seem to bother the low back, right? So this was a really big win for me. Um, and I had to practice what I preach a little bit because going into the workout, I really didn't think the leg press was going to go well, but it did. So there you go. Another movement I had to modify was a, a front rack reverse lunge. That was what was prescribed for me for the day. I write all my own programming. Like I said, I follow the ain't nobody got time for that program that I sell on my fitness pain free website. I'll put the link in the bio, but I was supposed to do front rack reverse lunges. And I'll tell you what, I couldn't tolerate any sort of loading. So I ended up trying picking up some light dumbbells and doing some lunges. That was not working either, right? Even taking a stride didn't feel great. So what I stumbled on initially that I was able to tolerate that day was some blood flow restriction split squats, right? So if I just put some BFR straps on and do body weight split squats, that actually felt pretty good on my lower back. So that's what I did initially. 30, 15, 15, 15 reps each leg. It feels like death, right? Uh, one of the things that's so awesome about blood flow restriction training is that you allow folks that feel like they can't do anything because load hurts so bad to get a good training effect, right? And if you haven't done BFR before, usually you're pretty dang sore after you do it. So it's kind of cool. You have these folks that have terrible low back pain, haven't been able to work out for weeks. You have them do some BFR training. They get super sore the next day and their back is not killing them. And that's a huge psychological win. People are like, wow, I can actually work out again. That's really cool, right? And that does, isn't just for low back. I find that for all sorts of injuries all over the body. It's one of the reasons why I like BFR so much, right? Over the course of time, I was able to tolerate a little more loading. I eventually progressed to a safety squat bar, a split squat, right? So I wanted to get a little uh, compressive loading on my spine to drive some adaptations, right? I want to be able to squat and deadlift eventually. So I started compressing the spine via safety squat bar uh, during split squats. And over the course of time, I just got better and better. And I was able to get back to front rack reverse lunges. No problem. So step two, identify and correct mobility limitations. So I've done a lot of assessment on my own body over the course of time. Historically, I have trouble with thoracic spine extension range of motion. So really my warm up, I just put some extra T-spine extension work over roller. The other place where I historically have some mobility limitation, which can directly affect the spine, is ankle dorsiflexion. And it's really my right ankle that's a little more stiff than the other. And generally speaking, I do full range of motion calf strengthening several times per week. And I think that's where I get the majority of my mobility for that area, right? Uh, but here's the thing. For me, I'm generally mobile enough for my activities in the gym without causing any sort of significant compensation, which is going to overstress the spine. So I didn't really have to do a lot of mobility in my rehabilitation. And you only really need to if folks are not tolerating uh, certain positions that are occurring because they're stiff, okay? So that's important. Uh, don't guess that people need mobility, assess them, and also use your brain, right? So if you're stiff in your shoulder, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna put more stress on the spine. But if you're really stiff in your ankles and when you squat, your hips go really far back and you have a ton of butt wink and someone has, let's say, flexion basal low back pain, then yeah, maybe we want to try to clean up their ankle doors flexion a little bit, get them to squat a little deeper without as much flexion, get their torso a little more upright, right? So they feel a little better when they squat. For me, I didn't need to do that. Plus I gained artificial ankle dorsiflexion by adding a giant heel lift the first couple of weeks when I was so painful. Step number three, correct technique issues. So for me, I've been squatting and deadlifting since I was like 12 years old, right? I'm 36 years old right now. You would think I would have this down at this point. Uh, and generally speaking, I think I do. Um, and the reason why I got hurt, I don't think was a technique issue in any way. We already talked about those potential mechanisms. Uh, if anything, I hurt myself running and it probably is because of overextension, right? And it's funny because I... When I was growing up, I, I actually did cross country and then track in college. And I, I'm a big runner. I like to run, right? So for me, I always try to increase my step length running because I felt like that was how I got faster, right? Um, and this is me as like, a, you know, a 14 year old. So I, I don't know how to get faster. I'm just kind of thinking in my own head. So what I did to get faster was I try to take bigger strides, right? I remember running on the sidewalk and just trying to increase my stride length as much as possible. Um, if you have a really, really long stride, it's probably going to make your cadence slower and it's going to make you overextend the spine a little bit more, right? The other piece for me is that when I'm on a treadmill, when you get tired and you want to keep going and you have a hard head and you're stubborn, you don't turn the speed down. You keep the speed high 
And then my compensation is just to overextend, right? So I can keep up with that speed. And for me, I overextended. And I think that's one of the reasons why I got hurt. So as I started to resume my running, I always do this anyway, is that I use a metronome just to make sure that my cadence is a little faster. So I'm not overextending when I run. The other piece is that I try to get my ribs down and lean forward a little bit so I don't overextend when I run. And those are a few key cues that I use to make sure that my spine is in a, a little bit of a better position for me so I don't hurt myself over the course of time, right? And my favorite step is to gradually load the spine. So fourth step in getting out of pain and back to training is to load the spine, right? And basically, I just did strength work three times a week prior to my training in the gym, right? And the reason why I did it before is because for me, doing these exercises made my back feel a lot better. So I was able to handle train on, training a little bit uh, more easily. Now for the average person, if you do a whole lot of, let's say, intense low back drills prior for your train uh, for the day, it might fatigue you out to the point that you do worse with your training. So it probably works out well for the majority of folks is that early on in rehabilitation, do your strength work beforehand because it's pretty low level. It's not that challenging and it probably makes you feel a little bit better, right? And as you start progressing along in terms of rehabilitation, so as you're getting stronger, pain levels are going down, you can put your rehab exercise at the end of the session, okay? So um, I did a bunch of different exercises. So I love hip thrust and folks have low back pain. Uh, if you want to see my favorite exercises for rehabilitation of the spine, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Do keep in mind that a variety of exercises can be beneficial for folks. So when I say these are the best exercises, doesn't mean that they're the only exercises, right? Or even that they're that much better. They're just my favorites and the ones I like. Um, they, they've been movements that have been really helpful for my weightlifters over the course of time, right? However, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, there's a variety of exercises that work equally well. So keep that in mind. So initially, I wanted to do some sort of hip thrust. I couldn't do very much in terms of hip thrusting. So I started with body weight glute bridges. As that started to feel better, I put a sandbag on my lap to increase the challenge to the spine. And as that felt even better, I did a kettlebell hip thrust with a TRX strap, which was well tolerated and really hit my lower back and glutes, right? The next exercise variation I did a lot of initially was clamshells. So I wanted to target the glutes a little bit, a little bit of the lumbar erectors. So I started with a sideline uh, band around the knees, good old clamshell. And over the course of time, I progressed to a half side bridge clamshell which gets the spine on board, makes it a little more challenging. I also did plank variations, started with a normal plank variation, worked my way towards marching with my feet. Eventually was able to march with my arms. And eventually I did a plank with a plate pass underneath my body, which just makes it harder. I also did a lot of mini band side steps. I had to start with a, a mega upright torso <laughs> just because bending over felt terrible. Eventually I could bend over a little bit, which I did because that stresses the spine a little more, which is the thing we want as we improve from a rehab perspective. Eventually, I add a kettlebell offset. Uh, so basically taking a kettlebell in one hand only and racking it while I do the mini band side steps. And what's nice about this is that you're still getting all the benefits from the side step, but the kettlebell is trying to bend you over towards one side. So adding that offset will allow one side of the core to work a little bit more, which we want, right? We want to try to stress the spine more as we get better. And lastly, I had a pull through in the mix, right? Initially, I couldn't do a pull through whatsoever. Once I was able to tolerate any sort of hinging, I just did a body weight good morning, nice and slow. Okay. That was my initial exercise to start tolerating hinging, right? As I started to feel a bit better, I was able to do a pull through, but I had to do it slowly with a tempo. And lastly, as I continue to progress, I just went a little bit heavier. Okay. So like I said, I did these one, two, three, four, five exercises, three times per week, two to three sets of let's say 10 to 12. Over the course of time, I made them more challenging, right? And after about six weeks or so, I just stopped doing these movements just because I'm getting a lot of spine loading in my general training. And then I also don't think I need to do these for the rest of my life. However, I probably will need to keep some strength exercises in my program over the course of time to keep my spine nice and strong to decrease the likelihood that I'll experience more back pain in the future because, hey, I've been getting recurrent low back pain. I probably need to make sure my back is nice and strong. So I don't hurt it again in the future. And I also have to be really cautious about those prior mechanisms we talked about, 
and just try to make better decisions in the future so I don't get hurt again, right? So if you guys want to check out the references, I have 10 of those. I'll put those in the show notes so you can check them out, all right? And then lastly, thank you so much for the support. If you're watching this on YouTube, give me a thumbs up. Also, I'd love to hear your comments. Uh, is this how you rehab your patients, right? Do you follow something similar? Is there something I miss, something that you feel strongly that I should know about to help my patients more, right? If you aren't already, subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell, which is essentially just going to alert you of when I produce a new video. If you don't hit that notification bell, YouTube may not show you my videos, so that's why you hit that. If you're listening to this on the podcast version of the show, please give me a positive rating and review. It helps that algorithm, helps me grow in the future so I can continue making content. So if you like it, it's a free way to support me. And lastly, if you want to go that next step with your education and support me, sign up for Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. All you got to do is go to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, then click on Fitness Pain-Free Insiders Online Library. It's $1 for a week trial, $12.99 afterwards. It's an absolute no-brainer if you want to take your education to the next level. All right, so check that out. I'll also leave a link in the show notes. Thanks again, guys. That's it.